since it's oh. that time. And um, <clears throat> I just want to welcome, we've got a few more people connecting and they'll, they probably will do so uh, while we're talking here. But I just want to welcome everybody to our March Boardwalk Talk. I'm Chris Hoffman, Executive Director of the Beaches Museum, and I'm so excited to have you guys here and to have the return of Dr. Peggy McDonald, who was one of our very last events last year before things closed down. Incidentally, it was also pouring rain the day she came, but at least we don't have to all leave the chapel and get back to our cars. So we're hopefully nice and cozy in our homes. Um, but I first want to thank all of, we've got a couple of board members on this call and several members. Thank you guys all for all you do and all your support. We've got um, last year, this time last year, we were, we were starting our year of celebrating um, the 100th year since the passage of the 19th Amendment. We had a wonderful full year of programming um, going on with speakers and exhibits. And of course, we all know what happened, but the benefit has been that the um, Breaking Ground Beyond Bathing Beauties, our women's history exhibit is uh, much longer than we originally intended to. So it is still available. If you haven't come to see it, uh, please come by the museum. It'll be up through the end of um, March. So we're going to go ahead and, and keep it up for the duration of Women's History Month. So please come by and see it. We're free and open to the public six days a week, every day except Monday, um, and free thanks to the donation of Edna and Maxwell Dickinson. So we invite you to come out to that. Um, our next exhibit is going to be a uh, Timaquan Parks Foundation exhibit, and it's the artwork of Kathy Stark, as well as photography of um, Will Dickey and Tom I uh, just lost his last name, photographer. They do um, nature art and uh, throughout the park system here in Northeast Florida. So that'll be going starting in April. And then April 10th, we have our Spring in the Blooms event. We took last year off, of course. Um, so this will be our second. I don't know if you call it second annual if it's not two in a row, but that'll be a great event out in the park celebrating um, gardening and beekeeping and all sorts of fun um, nature things. So make sure that you sign up for that in advance. We are having um, ticketed entry. It's only $5, but we do want you to register in advance so that we can keep tabs on, on who is coming as well as how many. So um, I am going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Peggy McDonald. And I'm just going to read straight from her bio because she's got a wonderful little bio. And if you have a minute to visit her Facebook page or her website, there's a adorable little cockatiel on her head. And I need to know what's the cockatiel's name. It's not in the bio. It's Poppy. <laughs> Poppy. That's so cute. So Dr. Peggy McDonald is a public historian and adjunct professor at Stetson University and Indian River State College. A native Floridian, Dr. McDonald is a speaker with Florida Humanities Florida Talks program. She has written about local and Florida history for Forum Magazine, Gainesville Magazine, Our Town Magazine, and Senior Times. In 2014, the University Press of Florida published her first book, Marjorie Harris Carr, Defender of Florida's Environment, which I think we can see over Dr. McDonald's right shoulder. <laughs> I love the product placement, well done. Um, Dr. McDonald's an alumna of the University of Florida, Go Gators, where she received a PhD in American history. She served as executive director of the Matheson History Museum in Gainesville from 2015 to 2019. Dr. McDonald, thank you so much for joining us today and everyone else. It looks like everybody's on mute, so I don't have to remind you of that. Thank you so much. Dr. McDonald, take it away. Thank you, Chris. I've never been introduced by a mayor before. What an honor. Congratulations, Mayor of Jacksonville Beach. Um, so exciting. And it's exciting to return also to uh, Beach's Museum. I thoroughly enjoyed my time there a year ago. And um, after uh, giving my talk, I went out to Bono's down the street. It's one of the last times I've been to a restaurant. So I think we're marking our lives now in terms of our last. Um, uh, it was an honor to meet a year ago, Emily Liska. And she was talking about how that talk was the last time she really went out, her last big outing before the pandemic. So um, I'm, I'm honored to be back. I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint. All right. So uh, is there anyone who cannot see this? No, okay. So today we're going to look at Florida women's fight for suffrage. And as uh, the mayor was just um, saying, this year's worth of programming, not only right at Beaches Museum, but 
across the nation was cut short due to the pandemic. So um, although this is not the centennial anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to talk about the subject. And um, Emily Liska, as president of the historical, uh, Florida Historical Society, also um, uh, chaired a panel, discussion panel, um, on this topic. So I invite you to look at the Florida Historical Society or Florida Frontiers website for more information on that. And Emily, I apologize. Uh, the, these women haven't provided me with any new material since then, so I'll have to work on a seance to, uh, to freshen things up another time. Um, but pictured, we have uh, Mary McLeod Bethune um, and Mayman Jennings, and you're going to hear more of their story later. But one thing I like about starting with these two women is that when we tell the history of suffrage, of women's suffrage, um, it's a split history. Uh, black women were excluded from the movement at the local, state, and national level. So part of the history of the fight for women's suffrage is this, this divide, right? There's a divide between black and white activists. Um, now we're gonna go way back before the push for the 19th Amendment to understand what it was that women were fighting for. Um, so when the United States was founded, when it was established, before it was the United States, right? Under the British colonies, there was a system of coverture inherited from Europe. And under coverture, women upon marriage lost their legal identity. They lost their right to own property. When the man and the woman married, they became one and the man was the one. So, um, so coverture is one of the things that women wanted to work to overcome and they came up with many strategies uh, for how to do that. Um, Abigail Adams was one of the most prominent early women to speak out against this policy. Uh, when her husband John Adams was um, at the um, uh, working as, as a, a patriot to, uh, put, to push the revolution forward, right? And to come up with a new system in America that would not be based on a monarchy. Uh, he, he left Abigail in charge of the farm, right? Of all the work and the large family. And he, while he was away, she wrote frequently. In fact, in her letter, she complained that John Adams did not return uh, her letters as much as she was writing to him. And in one of her famous letters written on March 31st, 1776, we could see this critique, right, of the system of coverture that had been inherited from Europe. She wrote John Adams, who of course became the second president of the United States later, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. Remember all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Now keep in mind as Ab Abigail Adams is writing at the beginning of the American Revolution as the Declaration of Independence is being drafted, she, the fact that she is writing is significant. So overlook the few uh, creative spellings, right? Which were really characteristic of the time. Um, as an educated woman, she was in the minority and she used her voice and the power of the pen to try to shape policy through her husband in this way, right? remember the ladies or we will foment a rebellion of our own. Now, after Abigail Adams, Mary Wollstonecraft helped to shape the, uh, to provide the theoretical framework for what would become the uh, women's movement later uh, in Europe. So in her 1792 book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, she made the case that women were entitled to equal um, education, right? Uh, that they had natural rights just as men had. Um, and that citizenship should also be extended to women. So this is a revolutionary time, not only in the United States, but also across Europe. And Wollstonecraft was um, an idol, right, for Susan B. Anthony. And Susan B. Anthony later would include some excerpts from her work in her own suffrage publications. And she had a framed portrait of Wollstonecraft um, hanging in her home. Um, 
a significant moment for the uh, push for women's rights and equal status in the United States actually came at the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London in 1840. If you look carefully, there's a highlight showing how at the, at the right of this picture, um, there were women standing at the convention and a bunch of men seated. Well, this was deliberate. Women, including uh, Lucretia Mott um, and Susan uh, Katie Stanton, I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, when they uh, went to London to join in the anti-slavery conference, um, they were not seated. They were denied participation because of their sex. So at this moment, women who had been working as abolitionists realized in addition to working to end slavery, it was time to work for women's rights in the United States. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott really bonded over this moment of exclusion and this led later on to the establishment of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Um, one of the products of this convention was the Declaration of Sentiments. And while the focus is on the push for women's suffrage, that was only one part of the Declaration. The Declaration of Sentiments was modeled after the Declaration of Independence. And in it, you see that women were arguing that they um, were, they were as worthy as men of equality, of citizenship, of education, and of the right to vote. Meanwhile, getting back to that divide between black and white women in the movement, Sojourner Truth was another powerful voice for women's suffrage. Like Frederick Douglass, she woke, uh, worked both on behalf of anti-slavery and um, women's suffrage. Like Frederick Douglass, she was over six feet tall. She had a commanding presence when she spoke and a deep voice. In fact, sometimes people in the audience accused her of being a man, falsely. But in her, her speech, right, so many people are familiar with, ain't I a woman, what she was really doing was pointing out this fallacy. Um, historian Nell Painter uh, Irwin has, um, she made the case, um, Nell Irvin Painter, made the case that, as she put it, at a time when most Americans thought of slaves as male and women as white, truth embodied a fact that still bears repeating. Among the, um, <clears throat> among the Blacks are women, among the women there are Blacks. So in Ain't I a Woman, Sojourner Truth is making the case that women includes Black women. And as a Black woman, Sojourner Truth had been bought and sold multiple times and had to work, had to co uh, complete very challenging physical work. And yet she was a woman, right? So she, she was a voice for equality for black and white women at a time when um, black women were overlooked under the category of enslaved people. Another thing to keep in mind is that at the time that the women's movement was pushing for um, equal suffrage, right? So after the success of the, the, um, uh, the end of slavery, after the Civil War, there was, there was still racism, right? So in 1869, in the Wyoming Territory, we have the first uh, case in the world, right, in world history of women voting. But it's important to keep in mind that women got the right to vote in Wyoming because of fears over black men voting. So according to the 15th amendment to the constitution, black men uh, gained the suffrage. Um, white uh, politicians who were fearful of black men exercising the right to vote in, the, in Wyoming, uh, so these are white Democrats, pushed for women to also get the suffrage. The idea was that with white women voting, they would be voting for those who advocated their right to vote in this case, Democrats, and therefore Democrats who tended to be white would have uh, the ability to outweigh the vote of newly enfranchised black Republicans. Well, this policy backfired when in Wyoming, women who gained the suffrage started to vote for white Republicans, right? They were electing rather Republican candidates. Um, so in, at that point, uh, Democrats in Wyoming actually tried to repeal the suffrage to take away the right to vote uh, from women. 
But the governor of Wyoming, who happened to be a Republican, opposed this measure. So we have this interesting give and take, right? One step forward, three steps back. Women worked to end slavery. Um, black men gained the right to vote. Women do not. In the Wyoming territory, women gain the right to vote. And then men try to take that right away when they don't vote the way they want them to. Um, now we're going to shift our focus to Florida, right? How do we understand the Florida women's fight for suffrage if we don't understand Florida history, which most textbooks tend to overlook, right? Um, in Florida, really, this was a, it was the first colony, it was a Spanish colony, and Spain used Florida as um, uh, an outpost, right? It was a military outpost. The goal was to protect Spain's empire in the rest of North America, Central America, and not exactly to expand in Florida. So Florida remained relatively um, uh, undeveloped in terms of population. Um, when Florida became um, a, a colony, a Spanish colony, this was long before Jamestown, right? Long before Virginia and Massachusetts. And as Michael Gannon, uh, one of the uh, people call him a father of Florida history, as he wrote, by the time Jamestown was established, St. Augustine was well into urban renewal. So Florida is misunderstood, right? Florida was this outpost. It was relatively um, uh, you know, low population. When Florida became a state in 1845, it entered as a slave state. And this was when the policy of Indian removal was still underway, right? Seminoles were resisting removal. Um, why are we talking about Seminoles in, in the uh, 1840s? Because even in the early 20th century, when women were pushing hard for the right to vote in Florida, Florida was the least populous state east of the Mississippi. And this is why, right? Because of its origins as a Spanish colony. Um, the first woman that is associated with the women's suffrage movement in Florida is Ella Chamberlain. And Elizabeth Taylor, not the beautiful actress, but the historian, um, wrote in the Florida Historical Quarterly over half a century ago that Ella Chamberlain moved to Florida and launched the women's suffrage movement in the state through her column with the uh, Tampa Morning Tribune. So she wanted to use the power of the pen to advocate on behalf of women's um, push for suffrage. However, like many other prominent uh, white women in the suffrage movement, her view was that as a woman, as a white woman, she should not be represented by what she called the alien and the Negro. She did not want foreigners and Afri African-Americans um, to be able to vote when she could not. So that was part of her, her push for suffrage. So it was a, you know, a racist and anti-immigrant view that really didn't go over very well in Tampa where she was living, which thrived on the uh, immigrant uh, population, the immigrant labor contributions to the cigar industry in particular. Um, this image of uh, Chamberlain at the top can be seen at the Tampa Riverwalk. Um, she um, uh, wound up leaving Florida sh shortly after the great freezes of 1894 to 1895, when um, the citrus injury industry was hard hit by a series of freezes. In this picture from the State Archives of Florida, if you look carefully, you can see these are oranges on the ground, right? There are none left on the trees. This um, series of freezes between 1894 and 1895 wiped out most commercial citrus in North Florida. And Chamberlain was one of the people who left the state rather than replant. So the, um, so the suffrage movement was a little stagnant uh, after she left. However, looking at the national level again, Ida B. Wells was considered radical. W.E.B. Du Bois was, um, uh, thought she was too radical for the NAACP, even though Wells was one of the early founding members. Uh, Ida B. Wells wanted the NAACP to take a strong stance on the uh, anti-lynching campaign that she had in endorsed for years. And when the leaders of the early NAACP did not accept that stance, she walked out and was, was encouraged later to come back. But Du Bois actually um, uh, was happy to see her go. 
Wells was uh, somebody who had already uh, practiced civil disobedience, right, in protesting a, a segregated transportation. When it came to the 1913 March on Washington, when um, women were showing their support for suffrage and calling for the ratification or the passage of the what was called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment uh, for Women's Rights, what became the 19th Amendment, Ida B. Wells was told that she could not walk with her delegation, that she would have to walk with um, other Black activists at the back of the parade. She waited in the wings and at the right moment uh, walked out so that she could march with the white women from her state. It broke her heart that after her years of working on behalf of civil rights, that the national leaders of the women's uh, suffrage movement did not want to embrace equal suffrage for black women as well. Um, meanwhile, in Jacksonville, if you look at the bottom row in the center, you see Eartha White. This is a picture from the State Archives from 1915, a meeting of the City Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. And so because of the racism that black women activists face, they formed their own clubs. They were technically allowed, black women were allowed technically uh, as members in the national chapters of the American Women's Suffrage Association and the Equal Suffrage um, Association. However, um, as we saw with Ida B. Wells, it was, not, um, it was not truly equal, right? They were not treated equally. And at the state and local level, women, Black women activists were openly excluded. So we see um, a parallel movement of Black women working for a suffrage in Florida. Um, Eartha White is also uh, well known for her efforts to, after the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, to uh, register thousands of Black men and women in Jacksonville to vote. Now, in Orlando, this is an image from um, about 1913 um, uh, in front of the old Orange County uh, Courthouse from 1892. You could see um, in this early, on this early automobile, it's decorated. And there's a banner that says equal suffrage. So the old women's suffrage association that Ella Chamberlain was associated with um, had dwindled in popularity and the equal suffrage association uh, took over when there was a call, a general call in 1912 for all freeholders to register to vote in the um, upcoming city election. Well, women, some women showed up to register to vote um, the, the various uh, men at the courthouse didn't quite know how to handle this request and they referred it to the mayor uh, and the mayor referred it to the lawyer who said that according to the state constitution, women clearly did not have the right to vote. This galvanized Orlando women and under the leadership of Mary Safford, uh, who had also been a leader of the suffrage movement in Iowa, um, the Orlando Equal Suffrage League took off and that later that year, the um, state convention was held and Mary Safford was elected president of the Florida Equal Suffrage League. Um, so what we don't know is if there were more, uh, more suffrage um, cars, right, or floats in this parade. We only know what we see where there's this one equal suffrage banner and women dressed in white in Orlando due to, again, the leadership of, Ma uh, leadership of Mary Safford. Um, and here you can see um, how, uh, uh, how uh, what a refined woman she was, right? Uh, an, uh, uh, an accomplished suffragist. And it's confusing because we know the David Bowie song, Suffragette City, Suffragette was actually considered an insult um, against uh, women. And so suffragist is the preferred term. Um, May Man Jennings was uh, first lady of Florida from 1901 to 1905. Um, and she became the president of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs from 1914 to 1917. This was a critical period um, because at this time, the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs was the largest organization for women in the state. Over 10,000 women were members of this club. So this was a powerful organization. And their view was that they could not support suffrage because it was too political. And if they um, openly su supported suffrage, then all the work that um, the members of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs did would be in jeopardy. Um, 
when Maynard Jennings became president, she held a different view and she convinced the leaders of the um, organization to support equal suffrage. In 1915, the members of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs lobbied, they began lobbying the Florida State Legislature and they pushed for uh, a, a state amendment to the constitution two times in 1915, both times it was rejected, but they continued to lobby, right? And to, and to uh, write to members of the legislature. Um, and they had uh, a, a different strategies that I'm going to look at in a moment. Another woman who became president of the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs had previously been president of the Gainesville Women's Club, known as the 20th Century Club, and um, she is, was also um, essential to uh, taking the leadership of the women's club and making suffrage, equal suffrage, a priority. So um, uh, from 1919 to 1921 was a really critical period, right? Because the Florida Federation of Women's Clubs routinely lobbied members of the legislature uh, for this three-pronged approach. Um, okay, I haven't gotten to the approach yet. Um, on the one hand, as I mentioned before, the Federation argued that there should be an amendment to the state constitution. So, so rather than wait for uh, the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, the Florida Constitution should be amended to allow women to vote. Another approach was to push for municipal elections, right? So women should be allowed to vote at the local level. And um, that was much more um, palatable to the men uh, who were in the Florida legislature. Um, and then the other approach was to allow women to participate in primaries. And this gets, gets to that same idea that existed in 1869 in Wyoming, that if more women are participating in political primaries, the Democratic primary is the only primary at that time, uh, you know, Black voters had been excluded. And so that would mean uh, more votes, right? More, uh, more votes for the Democratic primary. Um, so we'll address that again later. Meanwhile, like I said, this approach of municipal suffrage was very popular with the Florida legislature. Allow women to vote at the local level. That was the view. So pictured here is Zena Dreyer, who in 1915 became the first woman to vote in the state of Florida in a municipal election. So the idea was that, um, this, this made Felsmere the birthplace of women's suffrage in Florida. And there's a historical marker that um, talks about this. Um, so this strategy of allowing women to vote at, at the, in municipal elections, of course, led to women in leader positions um, like our new mayor, Chris Hoffman. Um, okay, so I had discussed these different strategies. So aside from letting you um, look at this beautiful map of Florida for a moment, uh, we've already gone over these three strategies, amend the federal constitution, constitution, amend the state constitution, and allow municipal elections, and also allow uh, women to vote in primaries. Meanwhile, um, another prominent uh, woman uh, suffragist in Florida um, who hailed from Jacksonville. Mary Nolan is the only woman for whom there exists a suffrage narrative, right? She wrote firsthand about her experiences as um, a woman who protested multiple times in Washington, DC um, and was arrested multiple times um, and described the night of terror as uh, she, as an elderly woman, was thrown against the bed and uh, mistreated. Now, at the same time, again, that she was active in the women's suffrage movement, it's important to note Mary Nolan was uh, the, one of the oldest uh, suffragists uh, she was born in 1842 and had memories of the Civil War and was an active member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So um, uh, another interesting character from Florida's suffrage history. Meanwhile, Tampa plays in a prominent role again, like Jacksonville, like Orlando, in that the very first suffrage conference was held in Tampa. Uh, the Tampa Equal Suffrage League held a conference and there was an, an earlier conference uh, when Ella Chamberlain was, um, was, was uh, giving birth to the women's suffrage movement in Florida. Uh, meanwhile, um, we have the very first female mayor uh, elected July 30, 1917 uh, in Moorhaven. This is Marion Horwitz. 
At the time, this was uh, considered the height of fashion to wear uh, parts of, of dead birds or entire dead birds on your head. I've changed that. I wear live birds on my head. Uh, really, I have, um, I have pet birds. You can also see uh, the, the stole around her neck. But aside from commenting on her fashion, including at a really beautiful uh, veil, um, Horowitz was elected mayor in 1917 because of women's um, ability to vote in some communities in municipal elections. Um, another example of this in 1919, a month after the 19th Amendment passed, wasn't ratified yet, but passed, um, the uh, Pearl Groves Maddox was elected uh, city commissioner in the tiny town of Archer in um, Alachua County, Florida. So yet another example of municipal elections having women the, uh, having the ability to vote in municipal elections and it led to women elected to office. Virginia Burnside is another example in St. Petersburg. Uh, and she was reelected twice to the position of, of city commissioner, first female city commissioner in St. Petersburg. Um, currently there are efforts um, going on to preserve her home in St. Petersburg and preserve the Berg as an organization with more information on that. So once the, um, the 19th Amendment is ratified, we see the very first woman voting in a Florida election uh, or in a US election after ratification is Faye Gibson Moulton Bridges. She was a widow with multiple children. She was working and her boss told her she better hurry up and vote. Uh, she went out to the back of the general store where she was working and voting was, a, was really not a glamorous um, affair at the time, but she was invited to the Florida governor's mansion and to the White House as a representative uh, of a, the first woman in the state to vote after the 19th Amendment went into effect in 1920. And she wasn't able to go because uh, of being widowed and having multiple children. I would like to pause and, and mention briefly, at the same time that we're focusing on this older um, battle for suffrage, where white and black women were um, forced, in, you know, black women were forced to form their own organizations to work for suffrage. Um, in the Seminole tribe of Florida, uh, later the first female um, tribal elder uh, and, tri and tribal chair was elected Betty Mae Tiger Jumper. Um, and she was the first and only female elected uh, chair of the Seminole tribe, but also the first female elected as tribal chair in the nation. Uh, so something to, to consider, right, of other Florida women working for suffrage. Um, one of the first things that happened after suffrage went into effect in 1920 um, is that uh, May Man Jennings, former first lady, who had been active in, in uh, working for suffrage, formed the Florida League of Women Voters. And the idea was to, to harness the power of this new voting block of women and to educate them on the issues, right? Um, at the same time that uh, white women were, were coming up with strategies to harness that new power of uh, that new voting block, Mary McLeod Bethune was working to make sure that all black men and women could vote. She used her school, now uh, Bethune-Cookman University. Uh, she opened it at night to offer classes to teach African-Americans how to read so they could pass the literacy test. She also rode on her bicycle around the community collecting money for a, the poll tax to help black men and women vote in Florida elections. Um, just like um, uh, Eartha White had uh, faced threats from the KKK in Jacksonville, Mary McLeod Bethune also faced threats from the KKK uh, in Daytona Beach. Um, but her work um, went beyond the Florida level. Uh, she actually advised five United States presidents um, on, on policy. And, um, and right now we're at the point where her statue will hopefully this year be installed in the US uh, Capitol Rotunda. Um, and it would be the first African-American woman statue installed inside um, uh, the rotunda. Um, so, and again, we're looking at 1920, that same year that the 19th amendment is ratified, there are renewed efforts to restrict voting rights, including um, African-American voting rights. So um, one thing that's important to note is that the um, 19th Amendment 
was not ratified in Florida until 1969. One of the reasons for that is that there was a, a fear among white uh, male politicians that extending the suffrage to women would also involve extending the suffrage to black women. And so um, millions more African-Americans would have the right to vote. Well, in 1920, uh, so last year at the uh, uh, Orange County Regional History Center, there was an exhibit on the Okoe massacre, which was um, a reaction to African-Americans using their right to vote in the community. Uh, and it led to um, uh, fires and deaths and the black community of Okoe was driven out of town. So this is that, that dark underbelly of the um, effects of the 19th Amendment, right? Where you have just as uh, efforts have, have been successful in extending voting rights to one group, there are other groups who are voting to take those rights away and to, um, to bar African-Americans in particular uh, from voting. So another um, example uh, worth noting um, from Florida history is along these lines, right, of registering people to vote, uh, Harry and Harriet T. Moore um, uh, were, were executed, right? They were assassinated. Uh, the, they, there was a bomb under their bed that exploded uh, on Christmas and uh, killed both of them. And it was a retaliation for um, Harry T. Moore's successful registration of over 100,000 African-Americans uh, registering them to vote. So the history of voter suppression um, has been ongoing in Florida and across the nation. So, so where are we today in the legacy of the 19th Amendment? Um, in Florida, the uh, League of Women Voters has been active in promoting additional suffrage for more, right? To extend suffrage, in this case, to uh, convicted felons uh, who have served their time. And, um, in the, in the news before the pandemic really took over all the headlines uh, was the effort to um, restore voting rights to, uh, to con formerly convicted felons, right, who had done their time. Um, so we're seeing uh, the continued efforts to suppress the right to vote. Um, I've lost track of how many efforts there are currently um, at, at, at in, in, um, in most states, right, across the United States to uh, make it harder to vote uh, in elections. So this broader history of the, the ratification of the 19th Amendment is a time for us all to reflect on the um, importance of extending the right to vote to all citizens. Um, on that note, thank you so much for listening and I'd uh, like to open the floor to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. McDonald. If anybody has any questions, you can just unmute and ask or feel free to type into the chat. And I would I had a I mean a few aha moments. And I think that the the reaction in 2020 to the 2020 election, which is kind of backsliding access to the vote, is it's just amazing in, in that parallel time frame. But um this may actually be a question more for Emily in this presentation and then um, last month in our Manhattan Beach presentation, Eartha White just figures so prominently in our history. And I just wonder if you think that we're doing enough to honor her. Does she have a school named after her? I know we have the Clara White mission. It just seems like she was such a powerful force in our community. And as a, a woman of color, that's just simply incredible to me. What do you think? Uh, Chris, that's a very interesting point. During her lifetime, she, and she lived such a long <clears throat> life and long and productive life. And, uh, you know, she took a role in the Great Fire right on through uh, civil rights movement on and on. She was actually honored at the White House. And there's a charming story that a uh, 44 year Congressman Charlie Bennett wrote. And um, Charlie, gosh, now he died in uh, 2003. But Charlie wrote the story saying he had invited her up uh, to, uh, to meet him in his congressional office as she was there. And um, he invited her into the congressional dining room. Now, I'm so sorry. I do not remember the year. I want to say the early 1960s, maybe a little later in the 60s. 
And he said, you know, I'd really like you to join me in the congressional dining room. And she said, well, I'm not so sure. And there was this back and forth. She had a twinkle in her eye, he said, but she, she sort of turned, well, I, I, I'm, I'm really already eaten and it's not necessary. And he said, but haven't you heard of the famous bean soup? And he said, then she really got a twinkle in her eye. And she said, yes, I'd love to go. And Charlie Bennett described that, or Congressman Bennett, I should give him his due, but everybody called him Charlie, described that as, uh, you know, Earth is great modesty for all of her works. And here she was being honored by the president. And <clears throat> she still was hesitant uh, to make entree into the congressional dining room. This was not typical, she thought, for an African-American woman, but indeed she did. And it was clearly a joyous occasion. She really uh, could get any mayor of the city to call her back whenever she uh, inquired. There was no problem there, but I think you're right. Uh, you don't hear much about her today, except through, of course, the Claire White mission. And what's happened is all the attention has gone to Clara's mother. I will say this, and Peggy McDonald would be such a great person to do it, as would others, but Peggy would really be choice. There's such wonderful research still to be had in the, in the world of, of uh, Eartha Mary Magdalene White, right down to her name. And I think that uh, uh, that would bring great attention to all that she did. There's a goodly amount written about her in uh, contemporary times. But, um, and, and I guess I'll run a resource on that. I haven't done that to see just what's out there in the academic journals otherwise. But I think you're talking about public recognition today. Am I right? And then of course, I'm, I'm fairly friendly with one Beaches mayor. So I <laughs> think <laughs> But nonetheless, um, I think that, um, I think you're right. And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll make sure to take a little more look at that. And also I'm gonna talk to Peggy. She's, she's terrific. <laughs> she really has uh, done a great service to the citizens of Florida and her study of Florida women. And I, okay, I did uh, have to I'd look. Like, I'd like to contact you, Emily, because sure, I was can. just invited to come up with a list of uh, Florida oh. women who who haven't received as much attention to oh, have brief, a little brief write up in a foreign magazine. So I'll be emailing you. Oh, oh, that's terrific. There are oh so many up on the screen. <laughs> I love you guys are on either side of me on, on in the little boxes. So I love that that connection just happened and I get to get to be in the middle of it. I, I did look up um, Felsmere when you were speaking. If you guys don't know because I had absolutely no idea where it is. It's near Vero Beach in South Florida. So in case you were wondering, and I missed the city that um, Mar Marion Horwitz was the mayor of, but it sounded small more, as well. More Haven. More, more Haven. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I use I use Felsmere in a uh, in a quiz that I had in a little history quiz. No one knew where it was at the time. I, I would ask Peggy uh, because I know you're real careful, Dr. McDonald, about keeping your tall where what you think is within some limits. Was there anyone or any piece of the movement that you left out that you would have liked to have included had you thought you had more time? Because you are just you know, such a font of information. You're very kind. There is, there's certainly more uh, to be discussed, but um, yeah, I think that it's good to pique people's interests and um, and not not over talk. I think that's, um, uh, I, I thought I was talking too much back when you were hosting the um, uh, wow. Florida uh, Historical Society event. And I just felt awful about it, but what a what a great thing that was that, um, that you got going. I'm, I was so honored to be included. Well, you know, I, I would like to point out, you know, Jacksonville for a point in history was prominent in the movement. And I would say uh, Mary Nolan and a real advocate of hers out of Jacksonville, a newspaper woman in Jacksonville named Helen Hunt. And I don't know if you spent a lot of time with Helen Hunt or not, Peggy. Um, she really um, connected with Mary Nolan, and Mary Nolan was probably one of the most atypical uh, suffragists uh, out there. And at one point, and I know Peggy knows this, 
Mary Nolan, after their many marches in front of the White House, after their, their arrest, uh, the suffragists who had been involved in what was considered a much more radical behavior, standing in front of the White House and occasionally burning a Woodrow Wilson speech, they then came up with this idea and an expensive idea for the time to create a train trip through parts of the nation. And their second or third stop on this trip is called the prison special. The women who had been in prison sewed prison uniforms and they were on this prison special and Jacksonville was one of the initial stops. And of course, any number of women were put out there to speak. The building still stands where they spoke that night down at the Morocco building downtown. And of course, in Hemming Park is where Mary Nolan spoke. And she was among the most popular based on her age. You know, they considered, they called her the nation's oldest suffragette, whether, or suffragist, let me correct myself, whether she's right. I loved your distinction at the beginning, uh, Dr. McDonald, the suffragist versus suffragette, that I will keep that in mind. Um, well, uh, I look forward to, to emailing you because I think that it'd be nice to, to maybe have you focus on, on uh, some of these Jacksonville women who have, uh, it's not fair to say any one group has been excluded. Everyone's been excluded, right? People, people ha don't tend to write about women in general. And if they do, they're probably not writing about Florida women. So um, a, a, your expertise would be a nice ad for the forum article. So I'll get, uh, I'll be getting in touch. With and you, you can thank Chris for thinking of it. That was very nice, Chris, thank you. I, um, you know, the, the exhibit that we have up at the museum right now, it's really interesting because our, our archivist who um, put the exhibit together kind of came at it from the, the, the thought that out at the beach in the coastal communities of Jacksonville, women could be a little more bold, they could be a little more outside of their expected roles. So we had um, women as postmistresses opening bars and, and doing different things that might not have been generally accepted in a larger city. And I wonder if that's true for Florida, since it was a little more of kind of a frontier, probably a little more. What do you guys think about that? Was this a place where women could just do things a little differently just as a state? I like the way you put that. Um, you know, depending on the time period, there were so many women innovators. Um, somebody who is a professor at University of Central Florida who I, I encourage you to invite to talk another time. She's a very engaging speaker, Kimberly Voss. She has written about uh, several different Florida women who were either uh, food page editors or women journalists of another type, um, including Roxy Bolton. So Roxy Bolton is one of those women who maybe hasn't received as much attention as for instance, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, but she worked on so many social causes as she was able to using you know, all the means at her disposal in the mid 20th century. And that's another point Kim Voss often makes, which is that uh, the 20th century tends to be overlooked. And, um, uh, you know, one of the first things I remember when I first got to know her, she would often say, scholars are just starting to look at suffrage, at women and suffrage, and when will they get to, you know, the 20th century? And, um, uh, so anyway, in terms of women getting away with things, there's so many women who completed first. And my talk a year ago focused on some of that, right? So women who, um, who are innovators, uh, whether it's in education or civil rights or uh, seminal affairs or you know, early women doctors. And whenever I hear there's somebody was the first, I'm always skeptical because chances are there was someone before, you know, and often long before who, who did that, such as the first female doctor in Florida. Does anybody else have any questions or you? Oh, go ahead, Deborah. Hi, I'm Deborah Johnson. I'm the district director for GFWC Florida in this district, District 4. And I wanna give you an update about May Man Jennings and what GFWC Florida is so trying to do. She is not in the Women's Hall of Fame in Tallahassee in the Capitol. And for the last almost 10 years, we have been trying to get her on that wall, um, just as an update, she not only the suffragist movement, the rights to vote for women, 
she also was responsible, along with Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who got most of the credit, for the uh, Everglades Park. She established the Royal Palm Park to begin with. And in the picture, she's on the stages there with Marjorie and along with uh, the president and other notables. But I wanted to give y'all, and we will have a time that we'll be emailing and calling Governor DeSantis. He is the last one and we've gone through his beautiful, gorgeous wife several years trying to hope that Pillow Talk would help. Um, but he's the one that has the final decision. And I just want to give you an update on um, May Man Jennings because we are working really hard in the state of Florida uh, through the women's clubs to have her on that wall. And um, I hope that the ladies here, I found out about this um, through the Jack's Beaches Women's Club. They sent me an email and I said, oh, I, I want to hear what y'all are up to with May Man. And um, I thank you for this uh, time and uh, Dr. McDonald, I'm just so impressed. And uh, Emily, I, I mean, I've never met y'all, but the historical value of this uh, hour or so has just been remarkable. And thank you so much for all you're doing. May thank I say, an update. yeah, it's great. And I will tell you, uh, gosh, kudos to the Beaches Women's Club. That's a good women's club. I'm a member oh, yeah. of the Jacksonville one. It's very, very small. And oh, uh, I wish I could get y'all on board with my district. I'm trying so hard, Miss Naughton. Is is she still your president? Catherine it, Naughton. I you you and I need to, yes, yeah, she is. Uh, okay. Catherine is. So we yeah, we need to talk so we coordinate. Thank you very much. So Deborah, I'll, I'll, I'll jotted your name down. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all y'all are doing. And it, it was very interesting. And I hope in the future to hear more about y'all. I was looking so I have my maiden man Jennings button from 2019 when yeah. there was a push to make her yeah. to add her to the Women's Hall of History. And I couldn't believe she wasn't added again. I know. And there, well, I she'll think be that, in there again this year. She's uh, got she's got a permanent nomination. They didn't agree to that. But they only do it, it's they only do three and um, a year. So we have to lobby every year. We've gone to Tallahassee. Like I said, we met with Mrs. DeSantis, uh, had a private meeting with her, hoping that the pillow talk would help, but that didn't happen. And uh, that's been our project and one of our top of the list legislations that we've tried every year for, uh, I know the last four years and even before that, um, but uh, she's done so much for the state. And, um, you know, she was not only a governor's wife, she was a Senator's daughter. So she goes back many, many years before we knew about May Man and her presence in Tallahassee was known very much. Even her sister was a secretary uh, for the governor when um, the husband was um, there. But, um, it, and she's from, she's buried at Evergreen Cemetery, uh, District 4 right now, we're trying, she has a park over by the cemetery and it's all grown over. We're trying to get some signage from Jacksonville to um, please acknowledge this park. Um, we're, District 4, my district is, is trying very hard. The previous district director, Teresa Crockett from Green Coast Springs has been very involved. And I've tried to continue that involvement. But um, I do appreciate uh, everything y'all are doing. And um, I really enjoyed Dr. McDonald, everything you had to say. I, I, I thank you very much. Never well, keep us posted on that effort. I would really be interested in hearing more about that as you guys go. Well, we appreciate all your yeah. time. Thank you so much. And congratulations to you, Mayor Hoffman. Thank you. you Thank behind, you so much. If you look behind me on my wall, there's a picture of the Beaches Life Club, our lifeguard station. I see it. Beautiful. My son, I'm a Jacksonville native, and my son uh, was a lifeguard back in the 60s. So I've had that on my wall for many years and um, that uh, love the beaches. So thank you so much. What? Congratulations to you. Thank you. That lifeguard station, just such an important 
piece of our skyline and our history as well. So yes, thank, thank him for his service to our community. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, this has been a lot of fun and we're right at an hour. So that's perfect. And nobody has to get in their car and drive home through this storm that's coming and going. So thank you all so much. Um, our board members, our members, our guests, and of course, our speaker, Dr. McDonald, will be calling you for next year for Women's History Month. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be in person again, uh, but we'll, we'll do what we can. Thank you guys all. If you want any information on our upcoming events, membership, anything else that the museum is doing, it's beachesmuseum.org, or just reply to the email that you got the Zoom link from, and, and we will get you whatever information you need. Thank you guys. Have a great night.